Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Welcome to this panel on federalism and democracy, meeting the challenges of political polarization. It's a pleasure to have you all join us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on where you are, uh, to discuss and reflect a little bit on the place of federalism in democratic settings and the challenge that federalism uh, uh, has to meet in terms of political polarization and how successful federations are in dealing with uh, political polarization or not. Uh, let me start by introducing our very distinguished panel this morning. Uh, we have with us from across the world a range of experts who've all worked in and thought about issues of democracy uh, and democracy building and who also have varied, uh, uh, varied professional backgrounds. Uh, Professor Arthur Benz is Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany. Monica Leroy, advisor to the Secretary General of the Organization of American States and a former advisor to the Canadian uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, Professor Nico Staitler, uh, who is South African Research Chair in Multilevel Government uh, at, uh, and, and Law and Development at the Dalla Omar Institute at the University of Western Cape and also a former commissioner of the South African uh, Finance Commission. And last but not the least, uh, Professor Rekha Saxena, Professor of Political Science at the University of Delhi and Vice Chair of the Center for Multilevel Federalism in Delhi and a, a senior advisor to the Forum of Federations. We have here this panel uh, in order to provide a diversity of views on the subject of federalism and democratization and the role that federalism can play in buttressing democracy. As you all know, the second half of the 20th century has seen an expansion of democracy and federalism and multi-level governance around the world. Uh, indeed, more and more people have been demanding freedom, human rights, and the right to participate in politics. However, democratization has also revealed deep divides in society and rising conflicts threaten democracy particularly as we've seen the stresses around COVID that have led to polarization along so many axes in so many parts of the world. Against this background, federalism has been expected, at least theoretically, to help stabilize government in divided society and to accommodate the claims of minorities. Democratization has fostered federalization uh, as it allows uh, 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 repressed groups, sometimes minorities, sometimes majorities, to express themselves politically in the countries that they live. In turn, federalism has supported democracy by constraining the concentration and centralization of government power. Thus, federalism and democracy at least has the promise to advance and stabilize each other. And federal democracy seems like an ideal political system in a liberal and pluralist society. However, as I've noted, uh, the stresses and strains that we see around the world uh, raise the question of where federalism is appropriate and where it may not be appropriate. Uh, according to the, the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index in 2020, only 24% of uh, 25 federal countries are rated as full democracy, 32% are rated as flawed, democ flawed democracies, 16% as hybrid uh, democracies, or sorry, hybrid regimes, and 28%, the full 28% are authoritarian. And in this context, I think, as uh, we go into the discussion, uh, we have to consider whether federations are more prone uh, to authoritarianism or more, uh, or more likely to be democratic uh, than non-federations, uh, and indeed, whether federalism is an asset or a liability. Uh, uh, for, uh, for democracy building. How can democracy be constructed in countries that have deep national, racial, ethnic, linguistic, or religious cleavages? And in turn, how can a system of federal democracy be constructed that reasonably accommodates the deep diversity while at the same time not stoking, um, uh, uh, um, not stoking uh, secessionism, not stoking further polarization? So this, in, this, in this webinar, what we've tried to do is to bring you perspectives from around the world. And I hope that as the discussion um, uh, progresses, uh, you, uh, the audience, will have 
um, uh, questions, queries, comments uh, to contribute uh, to our understanding uh, of, this, of this subject. Uh, the webinar is organized into four parts. Uh, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, into three parts, uh, where we first will have a round of opening remarks uh, from uh, our panelists, uh, who will also be addressed, uh, who will be asked to address uh, a round of three questions. And then as the, as the discussion progresses, uh, you know, we, we, we'll see uh, where it ends up. Uh, we will then ask the audience uh, to, um, uh, to uh, open up for question and answer, ask the audience uh, to raise any questions, queries they may have. And uh, we have some attendees who are on, uh, on, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a live stream, some on a YouTube stream, and, and depending on where you are, uh, please put your questions in, in the chat boxes, the question, I'm sorry, the question and answer boxes, and, and um, our, moderate, uh, our uh, technical team will feed them to me so we can put them to the panelists. And, and of course, then we will, we will end by uh, reflecting a little bit on the discussions uh, we have today. So uh, let's jump into the discussions. Uh, so I'm, I'm first going to pose a question to each panelist, and, and every, each panelist will have five minutes per question, uh, and then we, we, we will take off from there. So the first question I have for our panelists this morning is, are federations uh, prone to more or less democracy uh, or prone to be more or less democratic uh, than non-federations? Uh, Arthur, uh, let's start with you. Thank you, Rupak. Well, uh, if you look at uh, a few data, uh, there is a certain tendency uh, towards uh, federal democracies compared to federal aut autocracies. In a recent book, Robert Inman and Daniel Rubinstein counted uh, overall 26 uh, federal countries, and among them they identified 17 uh, democratic federations and uh, uh, nine federations with the labeled as uh, autocratic. When we look at the quality of the federation, and you provided some data in the introduction to this panel, uh, then we also find variations in equality of democracy in uh, democratic federations. Now, this is, so to speak, uh, the data part, and we can discuss about uh, typologies and indicators. But I want to point out another, uh, another issue. Uh, federations uh, combine different governments at different levels. And these governments can uh, be democratic or non-democratic and of course, more or less. And in general, we assume that uh, in a federation, we have the same regime type. We have either democratic uh, governments at the federal and uh, sub-federal level, or we have uh, autocratic uh, regimes at the different levels. And this is in general also true. However, comparative uh, research has uh, still uh, uh, found out that there are variations between levels and uh, also within the subfederal levels. There are variations in democracy, and there are variations in regimes. So we have to uh, consider that uh, a characterization of a whole federation as either democratic or non-democratic uh, only uh, provides as a very rough picture. So uh, on the one hand, we have to be aware that political regimes are determined on the different levels in a different ways, and there can be variation. This is one point. The other point is that of course, federalism and the way federal uh, systems work affect either democracy or autocracy. Um, we are well aware of this because federalism is, is not only division of power, division of levels, but it is also a coming together, a hold, holding together of federations, and it's in particular a working together of uh, federal and sub-federal governments in order to uh, cope with interdependence of complex tasks that governments usually face in modern democracies. There is interdependence between level in a federal system that affects the way uh, governments work. If we take this into account, and if we start, so to speak, from a 
two-dimensional view of uh, regimes in a federation, uh, which combine the structure of a government and the structure of the federation. We can understand results which we find in literature on comparative federalism. And this uh, literature provides us uh, 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 quite uh, different and more diverse uh, and differentiated picture. First of all, we can explain why we have indeed non-democratic federations. Many people uh, believe that federalism uh, necessarily needs to be democratic, but indeed we have non-democratic federations. And the reason why is that autocrats can profit from a division of power, although a division of power constrains their power, which they don't like, of course. But autocrats also can use, so to speak, a sharing of power in order to control opposition at the different levels. Autocrats can also profit from a sharing of power in order to shift the blame when they are not able to provide the services that uh, uh, citizens expect from them. So there is a certain advantage of uh, federalism for autocratic uh, rulers and autocratic leaders. This is one point uh, that explains why we indeed have federal uh, autocracies. The second point is that even in democratic or democratizing federations, it is possible that we have autocratic regimes at the sub-federal levels at individual constituent, constituent units at the sub-federal levels. Research has found this in particular in presidential regimes, for instance, for the US in the Deep South in the 19th century, or for some uh, Latin American federations in the 20th century, where we still find some autocracies at the sub-federal level. And the reason why they can persist is that autocratic leaders at regional or local levels can control the access of uh, politicians to the federal level, and they can profit from the support, the financial support or the financial autonomy uh, in order to maintain their power. So uh, this variation of democracy and uh, autocracy can indeed uh, uh, persist in reality. Third, even in uh, democracies, in federal democracies, we all know that uh, we have uh, the problem that uh, democratic governments, which claim to autonomously define uh, issues and policies have to cooperate in intergovernmental relations. And we all know that intergovernmental relation lead to some dominance of executives because it is executives that coordinate policies. Of course, this does not mean that uh, democratic federations become autocratic, but in any case, we have to be aware of this democratic deficit with, which can occur in uh, even democratic federations. So to conclude and to summarize, in general, I would say, of course, federalism supports democracy and democracy supports federalism, but we should also take into uh, account that uh, the uh, mutual support of federalism and democracy is not taken for granted. Political actors can always exploit the need to coordinate policies between governments, as well as the territorial limits of their power within uh, democracies and democratic control in order to strengthen that power. And this is, uh, always uh, goes to the profit of uh, executives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur, for that summary. Monica, same question to you. You're muted. Yeah, inevitably, I wanted to start the trend for us today. Um, Rupak, thank you so much uh, to you and the Forum of Federations for hosting this panel today. Arthur, Nico, Reka, it's a real honor to be sharing uh, this platform with you for this very interesting discussion. Um, I think I'd probably start by just commenting that federalism in and of itself is about decentralization of power and helping to ensure that governments are directly representative to the communities that they represent. Um, this is particularly acute in scenarios where there's distinct regions within a country, particularly with relation to ethnic or cultural communities, whether or specific geographic differences or industry. Um, 
but at the end, at the core of it, it, it's about ensuring there's better representation of the different interests across a particular country. Um, in Latin America, and specifically through the Organization of American States, um, countries have made a very concerted effort to define democracy as what they actually phrase as representative democracy. Um, and on September 11th in 2001, OAS member states uh, unanimously approved a document called the Inter-American Democratic Charter, uh, which ultimately provides a clear definition of what democracy is for its countries, enshrines it as a right for the people of the hemisphere, and creates both incentives for adherence to it, but also tools uh, and mechanisms for enforcing democracy throughout the region. Um, Article two uh, talks about uh, representative democracy as something that it requires permanent ethical and responsible participation of the citizenry within a legal framework, conforming to the respective constitutional order. Article three describes the elements, including respect for human rights, um, access to power in accordance with the rule of law, universal suffrage, free and fair elections. Um, article four is the components of democracy, which is what is relevant to what we're talking about, transparency in government activities, probity, probity responsible public administration, uh, respect for social rights and freedom of expression. Um, but at the end of the day, it actually comes down to explicitly, it is the right and responsibility of all citizens to participate in discussions relating to their own development. This is a necessary condition for the full, exer full and exercise of democracy, promoting and fostering diverse forms of participation strengthens democracy. Um, on the surface, I think the answer to the question appears like it should be a straightforward yes. Um, however, as Arthur pointed out, and I'm sure Nico and Rika will get into, it's a much more convoluted answer to that. Um, Latin America only has four examples of countries that have adopted or named themselves as federal state structures, and that would be Venezuela, Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. Um, all of these countries are notable, notable for their size and scale, uh, the diversity of geography they have within the country, but as well with different cultural communities that they represent. Um, in and of itself, there's been little change to the number of federal systems in Latin America over the past century. Um, at the same time, if you look at these four countries, uh, I'm not sure that we would want to look at this list as the most uh, stable representatives of democracy um, that you would see in the region. However, this is where I want to caution, where what are we talking about? Uh, is it is an issue of structure or is it, are there other issues at, attached to this? And that the challenges of democracy in these examples really shouldn't be attributed to the structure of the government that have, they've outlined or named in their constitutions. Um, Democracy is not a one fit size fits all initiative. Um, every country has to develop and consolidate its institutions in a manner that are reflective of its unique history, its unique cultural and social makeup, um, and as well as its decision, the, its custom of decision making processes. Um, systemic transformation also doesn't and can't happen overnight, and any attempts that we've seen around the world to, have, to do so have generally failed quite miserably. Um, federalism is a success when the structures within the system have been able to mature and consolidate their independence of power within the larger structure, while at the same time demonstrating that they actually can in fact engage and deliver for its citizens. Um, modern dictatorships are created by co-opting or dismantling democratic institutions. It is increasing consolidation of power within the executive and the pre eliminating the pre-existing power structures so at a very basic level, a federal system with a greater number of centers of power make that much transition that much harder. Um, if you look at key examples, um, such as Venezuela in Latin America, uh, its transition to a th complete authoritarian regime system over the past decade is one that ha would happen very slowly and very progressively. Um, but the last bastions of defense to preventing a full authoritarianism government from coming into play were government governors um, and governorates that were men were controlled by opposition leaders. It was local mayors that were refusing to reinforce um, unethical and illegitimate laws that were put into place. Um, so creating different structures and different systems that can place a check and balance on the power of the central system um, is one of the strengths that federalism has in defending democracy. Um, but at the end of the day, if someone wants to consolidate power, it doesn't particularly matter which system that they want to have, they're going to work on uh, impeding those particular systems. Um, I'll leave that there for now. Thank you very much, Monica, for your perspective. Nico. Well, uh, thank you, Rupa, for the opportunity. 
uh, fascinating that we can look at a topic from all sides of the world. My perspective will be uh, based on, on Africa and very interesting development. Since the end of the Cold War, the third wave of democratization taking place in Africa, which is closely coupled with decentralization and the rise of a new number of new federal or hybrid federal countries. And the big five uh, is here, uh, Ethiopia, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and also the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which are the major countries uh, in Africa. Um, now, there's nothing particularly, and I think uh, Arthur was really clear on that, uh, that makes uh, federations prone uh, to democracy rather than not. Authoritarian regimes are both in unitary and, and federal states. And one of the giveaways I always see is if you put your, the name of a country starting off with the Federal Democratic, Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, then you know you're in trouble because uh, it's neither be democratic nor federal. Um, and, and we see it across the world. One argument that it will be better for multi-party democracy uh, or, or, or that federation would be better is that it will promote multi-party democracy in the real sense that there are both uh, that there are winners and winners. It is not a one party take all uh, as the case in a unitary state. Um, and so um, the prospect then is uh, uh, that federations with multi-levels of uh, multiple centers of power could be governed by different political parties and giving real effect to multi-party democracy. And we've seen a case here in South Africa, in Kenya, uh, uh, important. But you can also see a very dominant party that hollows out uh, this prospect of multi-party democracy. And usually we find them in, or, or it's an exhibit or an indicator of authoritarian rule is Ethiopia, one party which at one stage had 100% of seats in national, regional and local government uh, uh, councils. And there was a bit also in South Africa when a dominant party would govern eight of the nine provinces, leaving only uh, a, a one province open to uh, some uh, truly multi-party uh, democratic uh, experience. That is changing now with the loss of the ANC uh, now for the first time in the local elections, under 50% of the vote with a number of municipalities now governed not by the municipality, by the, um, uh, by the, uh, by the center and, and the ANC. Um, the other question that, that, that we ask uh, or just shown up is the problem of what we understand of under democracy and how federalism impact on that. And that is whether where regions are regarded as equals although they don't have the same number of people in them. So in South Africa, for example, the small, the largest geographical area in the country has got one, one million people. It's got 10 seats in the second house of parliament. Gauteng with the smallest geographical area, but 15 times the size of, uh, of population of, uh, of Northern Cape has also got 10 seats. So when your decision making is then affected, you see the, the popular inequality uh, being trumped by regional equality. And that becomes a strain, can and be a strain on, uh, um, on, on democracy. And we saw in the US how the federal system allowed um, Trump to beat um, uh, Hillary Clinton the latter having the majority of votes. So uh, so it's both that I would say uh, can be advanced democracy, particularly multi-party democracy. On the other hand, there's all the constraint on what we regard then as more popular, and I think what Monica referring to, representative democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liko, for your perspective. Rika. 
Hi, uh, thank you, Rupak and Forum of Federations for this invitation. And it's an honor to be part of this distinguished panel. Now, uh, I think generally in modern times, uh, federations and democracies, uh, they are congenial with each other in the sense that a federation in modern times is almost, you know, invariably a democracy as well. And uh, I think among the extant federations, practically all are democratic, though uh, as pointed out by other colleagues, uh, the degree may vary uh, depending on different contexts, political, cultural, historical contexts. And examples are United States, America, Canada, Switzerland, Germany, Australia, India, et cetera. On the other hand, I think uh, both uh, United, uh, USSR in the past and also the Russian Federation in the present, you know, claimed or claimed to be federal. But uh, in strict uh, conceptual and theoretical terms, neither can be accepted, you know, as uh, either democratic or federal. And this is largely uh, because the Communist Party of the USSR was thoroughly under an authoritarian leadership. And even the Communist Party in the Russian Federation, I think is also authoritarian in its organization and leadership. Now, as far as India is concerned, uh, even in ancient times, there were federations which were democratic called republics like the Vishali and like in ancient Greece, you know, uh, but gradually they were conquered and uh, by monarchies. Now, having said that, I think federations are likely to be less democratic uh, because such a system may constitutionally give more powers to some communities unjustly at the cost of other communities. For example, in India, until this uh, Article 370 was abolished uh, with regard to that gave special status to Jammu and Kashmir, uh, often it was criticized uh, by a Hindus, a Hindu majority that Muslims enjoyed you know, minority rights in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, where they were in majority. Though within the state of Jammu and Kashmir, Hindus should have enjoyed uh, these minority rights for the simple reason that they were a minority within minor in that state, despite being a national majority. So in this instance, I think federalism is prone to be a liability because minorities within minorities, they feel vulnerable. And uh, so, uh, but Indian constitution has tried to uh, protect the minorities within minorities by providing, making some provisions in the constitution like article 350 A and B, uh, where it provides that every state, uh, you know, must provide uh, primary ed education in mother tongue and also provide for special officer for linguistic minorities and uh, which is to be appointed by the president um, at different uh, at regular intervals. So, but uh, generally, I think federalism is an asset uh, for India uh, because it tries to reconcile diversity and thereby helps in national integration and promoting nationalism. That's what I feel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rekha. Uh, I mean, already I can. Um... Uh, you know some, some ideas that are coming up. I, I'm 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 going to proceed pro forma with the next question, but I just wanted to uh, to identify some issues that are that are that have already started coming up. Uh, one is the issue of de democracy in the center versus democracy in the periphery. The other is that of group right versus individual right that I mentioned. And uh, related to the uh, to the former uh, is an idea that uh, Charles Tilly brought up in the 19, late 80s, early 90s of the state as organized crime. And so thinking of uh, you know, crime syndicates at the, at the center and crime syndicates at the periphery as uh, being a structure of federalism. But, but we'll return to those uh, uh, in, in, in a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reverse the order of, uh, of uh, questioning at the next, the next question. Uh, so, you know, so, the, so the question is, um, uh, how can democracy be constructed in countries that have deep national, racial, ethnic, linguistic, or religious cleavages, uh, given that, uh, that that you want you want you want a system that is democratic both at the center as well as uh, in in the, at the subnational level. Uh, that uh, and I guess this this relates a bit to the the, the issue of individual versus uh, of, of group rights. So, uh, uh, Monica, why don't we start with you? Um, 
So, I mean, the, the, the framing of this discussion today is about federalism and polarization. Um, and what I would describe of what we've seen in the United States over the last five years, what we've seen across Latin America, is that polarization is caused by marginalization, by inequality and exclusion. Um, yes, it definitely can be fueled by religious fundamentalism and social media, but th those at its core are not the root cause of it. Um, it's the underlying issue that these individuals, um, whether they're individuals or groups, feel that they've been left behind or, or, or cut out of, of a system that's supposed to actually be representing their particular interests and views. In a federal system, as much as decision making is designed to dis diffuse power, Unless a political grouping controls the political system, it's not a guarantee that everyone's voice will in fact be represented um, at the decision-making table. Um, if decisions are made against the interests of a particular group, um, particularly if that group is not represented in that conversation, the, the very legitimacy of the process and therefore the very legitimacy of the system itself can easily be called into question. Um, I actually think probably the most obvious example for this could, uh, could be Canada. Um, in Canada's parliamentary system, we, when we established the cabinet, which is the foremost decision-making body in our government system, um, there's no set rule, but informally, every single prime minister and every single government does its best to ensure that there is a geographic representation from different regions of the country, uh, gender representation, um, and ethnic and cultural representation wherever possible. Sometimes that's not possible. Um, where you've seen a lot of polarization develop in Canada over the last, in recent years, has been um, at West in Alberta and Saskatchewan, which are provinces that are not represented in the government governing party and therefore not represented in decision-making processes. So therefore you see a segment of the population that does not feel their voice is included in any of the discussions that are happening. Whether that's true or not is, is, is one question, but the perception of it is, is a very tangible reality. Um, in Latin America, one of the key issues that we've been seeing uh, fueling uh, uh, populism and kind of polarization with the, within the political communities um, is the endemic corruption that we've seen impact a number of the governments. Um, that Latin America, which may surprise some people, actually has the highest rates of inequality in the world. Um, and a, prior to the pandemic, which kind of creates another layer of these particular discussions, um, you already saw a number of widespread protests across the region when Odebrecht scandals relating to kind of Odebrecht, the Brazilian construction company, or the Panama Papers came out, where you're seeing vast pools of wealth within a tier of elite that there doesn't really change. Um, what the public ultimately wants is they want a government that actually delivers for them. They want um, a, an economy that works. They want job opportunities. They want personal safety and personal security. Um, they want basic health care, access to basic health care, education for their children. Um, these aren't really high standards to set to, but when you struggle to live, deliver these basic services, whether it's a federal system or any other system, it calls into your, your trust in any sort of governing factors. It calls that into particular question. Um, Again, coming back to the, the first conversation that we had, one of the advantages of the federal system is that you're not expecting one particular body or one particular group to solve all of those problems and give, give an answer to every single one of those questions. Um, you're not expecting uh, a government in, uh, in Sao Paulo to be responsible for the school district in a small district um, in the Southwest tip of Brazil. Um, you actually are, are divulging that power, diffusing that power to people that are better suited to understand the needs of that particular community and to know where to build the school and to know what that education needs require. Um, and, and that's sort of where the strength of this needs to be. It's not just about is the system the right system, but have we actually built the capacities within these particular systems to deliver the services to their individual communities that will in turn give by and, and ensure the trust and interests of those populations in the government itself. Thank you. Uh, Arthur, uh, your, uh, if, if you would address the question, please. Yes, thank you. And I think I can follow uh, uh, the uh, statement uh, of Monica, uh, but let me first uh, try to understand uh, what uh, means uh, deeply divided societies, societies uh, divided uh, according to national, racial, and uh, ethnic, linguistic, and so on uh, conflicts. I think the uh, most serious problem of these societies is that uh, one of the communities feel feels dominated by the majority 
in uh, the society for different reasons, for historical reasons or for structural reasons, uh, whatever it is. And this leads to the fact that these societies lack something which is essential for a democracy to work, namely the mutual acknowledgement of uh, citizens and communities as equal and a mutual trust of citizens and communities that they are able to uh, determine their common fate. There is mistrust and there is domination or uh, perceived domination and that's the problem. And the question is, how can we uh, solve this? Um, I'm not really an expert on this. Uh, my experience comes more from the Western states, including Canada, uh, where we can learn a lot uh, how these things are solved because these are uh, federations that struggle for a long time uh, 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 with these uh, divides. And I think there are uh, two basic kinds of solution we can discuss. One has to do with democracy. And democracy can provide different ways to uh, compensate the perceived or real uh, dominance of minority uh, communities, for instance, by providing uh, special representative rules, by providing veto rights on uh, special issues which can protect uh, the rights of these communities, by providing participating participation right in particular policies and so on and so on. So democracy can provide some uh, uh, ways to solve these uh, 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 problems, these cleavages and this uh, arbitrary domination. Uh, but all these uh, solutions require that uh, these groups are organized that they can speak uh, with uh, by representatives and that they can form a common will. And now this is where federalism comes in, in my understanding. Federalism can provide uh, an organization for these communities because federalism, either on a territorial or on a personal basis, can provide a structure uh, where these uh, communities, these minority communities, can have their own government and can organize their own political processes. So uh, federalism is obviously important, an important solution uh, of uh, these uh, problems of deeply divided societies. However, so, uh, federalism as such is not a solution because uh, federalism is usually uh, a solution which uh, is based on the ideas that powers are divided and that these disadvantaged communities can autonomously decide on the affairs. The problem is that in all federation and in particular in these uh, federations in divided societies, uh, the problem is that autonomy and the division of power is always contested. Uh, it's always contested when it comes uh, to solve uh, policy conflicts uh, policy conflicts are always uh, linked with power conflicts, and in particular in these uh, divided societies. And the consequence is we can only find a kind of balance or a kind of processes uh, of balancing if the division of power and the relation between, between these uh, minority and majority communities, between federal government, uh, sub-federal governments, and minority governments, so to speak, uh, uh, have not uh, fixed powers which are contested, but that they can continuously adjust and renegotiate the allocation of power. This is clearly uh, expressed by André Lecour in a recent article where he sa said that uh, multinational federation has to be flexible, a flexible, dynamic federal arrangement. This is a citation uh, from André Lecour. Flexible and dynamic arrangement uh, require either constitutional amendments or a renegotiation of the actual uh, uh, allocation of power. Now, uh, the problem is that these negotiations are increasingly different, difficult uh, under the condition of polarization. Polarization, And as Monica has uh, uh, clearly uh, pointed out, these societies uh, suffer from polarization. So how can we deal with this? 
usually people uh, argue, okay, then we have to clearly divide power, to separate power. The emphasis would then be uh, on autonomy. But I don't think this is a solution because uh, autonomy uh, not only is contested, autonomy uh, leaves open the problem uh, of a federation, uh, of every federation to deal with interdependence. And even these minority communi communities, if they deal with their individual affairs, their uh, uh, specific concerns, they uh, have to uh, 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 coordinate their policies with uh, the majority uh, society. So there have to be linkages, there have to be communication. The only solution is, in my view, not, uh, so to speak, established intergovernmental uh, negotiations, which always can run into the, a trap of uh, confrontation. The only solution is to find multiple linkages between parties in multi-party systems. Uh, in, in integrated party system, including regional uh, parties and minority parties, ethnic parties in a, in a common framework of, of a party system. Uh, one solution could be uh, interparliamentary relations, committees of parliaments that have been discussed in Canada, for instance, uh, which cannot decide, of course, but which can provide communication and which can provide a kind of uh, structure that loosely links these different uh, levels and different communities. So um, what I think is that we should not only discuss these problems of divided uh, societies uh, in terms of a federalism, which is based on autonomy and separation of power. We have to find a federal system which can provide communication and linkages between these different uh, societies so they that they can overcome their polarization and their cleavages. Thank you, Arthur, for your question. Nico. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, just to follow up actually on, on what Arthur was saying, is the thrust in, in, in Africa has been to use federalism as a problem-solving device for deep, not ethnic uh, cleavages, but civil war. If they think of the most recent cases where they're busy trying to write a constitution is Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia. This is born out of civil war, and this will be what's going to we are to look at the future for Ethiopia. Now, the first op, uh, answer, and, and, and that's the autonomy answer, is let democracy uh, be devolved, let there be self-rule in a classical federal uh, term, um, and so accommodation. But then the problem of democracy is then the growth of chauvinism, of, of ethnic chauvinism, exclusive areas, uh, secession, all these problems arising. So that per se cannot be the answer, just a, a, a accommodation of ethnic groups or religious groups. So it's the context of trying to de-emphasize these cleavages by having soft borders for one. So that a country do, of a region do not have clear ethnic rules, which leads to ethnic cleansing and, and, and may also lead to um, secession. The other counter one, and, and, and this is where I want to join with, with Arthur, is back to the old split, self-rule and shared rule. And very little attention is being paid to this notion of shared rule. And this shared rule should run throughout, and, and what I even call the centralization of democracy, is how do you share in legislation through the second chamber, operationalize that as, as one angle of co-determining co uh, certain laws, critical. But then equally critical is the sharing of democratic institutions like the presidency, um, where in, in a number of African countries, like Kenya, uh, Kenya and Nigeria, you only get elected if as president if you have widespread support in a number of regions, at least half, so that you are representing not an ethnic group, 
the plan, but uh, that you are at least got claims, 25% of half of the uh, of the of the counties in, in Kenya must support you. So that's the fault. And then the critical part, which are also overlooked, is that democracy is one thing, a vote is another. Uh, cooperative governance is a further one, but it is the benefit that the regions, the people from the regions have in the center where all the action is. So it is the visualization, the actual um, carving up uh, in, in a sense of your central administration so that it reflect what they call in Nigeria, the federal character. And very little attention is paid about how do the regions join in common loyalty uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to the country, not to the nation, but to the country, and that is through inclusion. So those are the classical self-rule and shared rule, and shared rule being under, undervalued. Then the other uh, one is because of unclean, unclear boundaries, dispersed groups is the notion of personal federalism as, as, an, as some people express it. How do you, as a group, which is dispersed across the, uh, the country, can exercise, and that's back to where you call the group rights in terms of education, in terms of culture, how can there be sufficient uh, support for a group that hasn't got a, a territory. Uh, and that could be a group or in personal not being discriminated against because of your language or, ethn or ethnicity. Thanks. Thank you, Nico. Rekha. Yeah, I think uh, the only way uh, democracy can be constructed in a deeply diverse and uh, divided country is through federal accommodation of conflicting identities and interests. And uh, uh, in my view, these diversities cannot be suppressed by the center because this approach uh, would rather uh, aggravate them and uh, lead to untimely breakup. And the examples are again, you know, aptly provided uh, by the Indian subcontinent. Um, like India is one of the largest federal democracies and uh, we have remained united because it, uh, India has tried to uh, strictly you know, follow democracy and federalism as far as possible. Uh, so we did not suffer to that extent. Of course, there have been aberrations, but Indian constitution, I would say, has tried to accommodate diversity by providing fundamental right, individual rights in terms of fundamental rights, uh, for individuals and then group rights as pointed out by Nico and my other colleagues uh, in other in Indian constitution also in article 29 and 30 uh, with respect to cultural and educational rights for minorities. And also there have been provisions for excluded groups and uh, policy of protective discrimination, you know, uh, and there have been institutional mechanisms to uh, deal with, you know, uh, this uh, instances of discrimination for minorities, and most importantly, the asymmetrical provision of power sharing with regard to, you know, uh, uh, some uh, states, uh, some regions, like uh, we had uh, this Article 370 with regard to Jammu and Kashmir, they, then Article 371 A and G with regard to Nagaland and Mizoram, then the entire family of Article 371 except A and G for hinterland tribal populations and uh, some other uh, provisions. And, and uh, fifth and sixth schedules of the Indian constitution with regard to Northeastern states. Mm -hmm. So I, and then, so I think India has to a great extent, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, these asymmetrical provision of power sharing have helped in holding the nation together. And, uh, and uh, in, if you see Nepal, that is the nearest entry to the federal family. Uh, so federalism uh, tries to accommodate diversity and uh, therefore though Nepal is not a large country, but it is uh, a very diverse nation. However, Pakistan, you know, broke up in 1971 when the Punjabi, you know, dominated 
uh, West Pakistan sought to ruthlessly suppress the Bengali majority in East Pakistan, which uh, you know eventuated into a separate nation of Bangladesh. So I think, uh, as pointed out by Nico, Arth, and Monica, I think uh, the uh, it is important also important to uh, uh, strengthen shared rule institution uh, besides the self rule institutions and communicate develop communication linkages. You know, so that's what I feel. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. Rika, uh, uh, in the context of uh, the self rule. Uh, given that many federations, including the ones that Nico has talked about, uh, less so less so in Latin America, uh, uh, but, but certainly in Africa and Asia, given that given that many many federations are 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 constructed as um, uh, as uh, compromises based on group identities within the context of shared rule. Uh, how do you ensure full uh, participation or democratization uh, by groups who do not represent an identified community at the subnational level? I think uh, there's need for in every federation we need uh, you know some kind of provisions for protection of minorities within minorities. Uh, like in India, uh, as I pointed out earlier, though Muslims, they are in majority in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, but they are, they are national minority. Similarly, Hindus, uh, they are national majority, but they are in minority in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, or Sikhs, for that example, they are national minority, but they are in majority in Punjab. So there's need for you know, uh, provisions for uh, uh, to protect the uh, rights of these minorities within minorities. And uh, uh, to some extent, I think in, I don't know about uh, other federation, but in, as I pointed out about India, there are, of course, minorities within minorities feel vulnerable. And that is, uh, you know, one of the major, I think, uh, uh, problem in India, how to protect the interest of these minorities within minorities, but some, uh, there have been abrasions also, so I think we need to uh, do more in that direction, you know, to protect, though there are some provisions in the constitution, but uh, the reality is different. So we have to, I think, uh, we. I don't justify it, I think we need to stop it and uh, to protect the interest of these, these groups. No, no I, I'm not, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not say you're justifying it or not, I'm just asking a question. And Nico, the same question to you, because I mean, this is an issue uh, in, in, in Africa as well, where uh, you know, the, the question of minorities within minorities, enfranchised minorities within minorities is something that many countries uh, are grappling with. So I'd be interested to hear your perspective on this. You're muted. To un unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Okay. We, we, we're traveling at the moment with this very problem in, in Ethiopia, where you, they built the federal system based on ethnicity, which of course, and they drew boundaries, but none of the boundaries are complete or are, are linguistically uh, pure. So now they've got uh, sub minorities in a minority, so at local government level, but that again becomes a little fiefdom. So the only way that I'm arguing that you can proceed out of this is to make ethnicity not the governing or the overwhelming or the only criteria in proceeding. And that's why coming used to the concept of soft boundaries, meaning anyone in a given area has a stake in it, as opposed to being outsiders, uh, not being able to, 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 to uh, get work because you only have uh, jobs for the, the sons of the soil, as, as they call it in Nigeria. Um, and, and you also have it very springing up in, in, in Kenya, this notion that if I'm from this county, I'm entitled to work and we exclude anyone else. So it is a political shift in, and you can also probably in, in, in various mechanisms, try to sh move it away, de-emphasizing ethnicity, but talk about the economic uh, unity of a, of, of, of a particular region, um, how it works, and, and that there's space for others. 
um, it's trying to, to not, not to unravel, but to tone down this direct linkage between a minority and a, and a territory so that there's space for others. And you can do it with, with various legal, legal rules, non-discrimination. In Ethiopia, there were um, uh, cases where in a particular area, only if you spoke that language could you uh, be, be employed, which excluded anyone else. Thanks. Uh, Arthur, um, uh, over to you. I mean, this is uh, this is, of course, particularly pronounced in in Africa and Asia. But Europe is not, uh, or, or indeed North America is is. Uh, I mean, this issue of uh, dealing with minorities within minorities is not unknown. Uh, but uh, if uh, if I heard you correctly, when you made your opening statement, you noted that the issue of inter interdependence in a federation uh, allows sometimes for the persistence of, um, uh, uh, shall we say, less, uh, or, or the tolerance of less than uh, uh, totally democratic norms or in, at the subnational level. Uh, how, how, how does one, in your view, in the context of uh, the, the transatlantic uh, uh, federations deal with something like that? Uh, well, I have, uh, of course, no solution. Uh, this, is, this is a very difficult uh, problem. The uh, general uh, answer would be, uh, which you find in the older literature, you should avoid uh, majority uh, rule, majority democracy, both at the federal and at the regional level. The problem, of course, is uh, deciding uh, by negotiations can uh, lead to deadlocks or can uh, end up in uh, compromises that don't really uh, solve the problem. Uh, I would point out to an interesting uh, example we have in Europe, which is, you know it very well because it's a famous federation, which is Switzerland. Switzerland nowadays doesn't uh, count as a multinational divided federation, but it was in the 19th century, as you might know. Uh, there was a Catholic part and a Protestant part in, the, in 19, uh, 1848, they even uh, had a war. And when they uh, formed the Federation, the Protestants dominated. So uh, they had to solve this conflict. And uh, how did they do it? The first solution was, uh, in a way, a consensus uh, or in a, a, a representation of all parts uh, of the Federation in the government. Uh, step by step, they included uh, representatives from the Catholic part in their government. That's the reason why they have a, a, a council government. But the other way they solved the problem was by introducing a pure majority democracy to come to the final decision, which they make by referendum. And referendum is a pure majority democracy. However, the effect of this uh, referendum democracy is that all uh, all uh, representatives of uh, uh, political parties uh, and groups want to avoid the risk to become a minority in the majority decisions. Therefore, they started to invent uh, renegotiations and uh, found agreement in order to avoid a final uh, majority decision. And that's the reason why in the shadow of a majority democracy, uh, the Swiss invented a, 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 a consensus democracy, which is really a democracy aiming at a consensus, not a pure conflict. This is a, a bit an idealization of this case, but it probably shows that um, the solution which we have uh, to find should uh, always combine different uh, elements of coming uh, to uh, solutions of conflicts, because there are different ways to solve these conflicts. And I think uh, the other speaker, in a way, have also pointed out this uh, argument. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, Monica, I'm going to turn to you and ask you two questions, possibly both related. Uh, <laughs> but but it, it's, it's sort of a, a thread that's coming out through the discussions we just, just had. 
uh, given the hemisphere that you work in, uh, and the discussion around democratic backsliding in some countries in, in that hemisphere, um, do you think uh, federalism has acted as a break in some of these countries against democratic uh, backsliding? What do I mean by that? I mean, had they not been federal countries, uh, would we have seen a greater degree of democratic backsliding uh, or, 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 or less? So that's, that's the first question. The second question uh, comes out of what Arthur said uh, in the context of Switzerland uh, about um, uh, 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 reaching, reaching majority decisions that are pre-negotiated. Uh, and in this context, I want to draw on your experience as somebody who's been in government, in politics, to reflect a little bit on the importance and utility of uh, proportional representation or a mixed uh, 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 represent, uh, a system with uh, mixed representation, an electoral system with mixed, uh, you know, that's, that's a mixed system uh, uh, to, to think about how one might overcome polarization. So over to you. Um, <laughs> those are dramatically different questions. Um, so, I mean, I alluded to, I believe in my first answer that I, I genuinely believe the federal structure in Venezuela helped slow down the process um, of, of Maduro's transition to kind of a full-blown dictatorship and failed state that we now see in Venezuela. Uh, whereas you had different governors controlled by opposition parties that were able to withstand um, some of the early directives. Um, I, I mean, by nature, the transition from democracy to authoritarianism in the modern age is a very incremental process that happens in plain sight. We all see it happening, um, but it's done with these small steps that it, it's international community is very reluctant to engage and, and inter, intervene until it's sort of well down the path of, of authoritarianism. And I mean, this is what we have seen in Venezuela and we're starting to see this pattern happen in, in other countries in the region as well, um, or at least this trend, which hopefully is a short-term trend rather than a long-term trend. Um, but the effort is to first, is to consolidate power in the hands of the executive. And initially those steps are about consolidating the military, the judiciary, the branches of government, weakening any legislative capacity and any legislative authority. I mean, this is, these are the first measures that Venezuela took. Um, and then after that, you have to tackle the particular regions. Um, in, in Latin America generally, both in South America and in Central America, part of the, the advantage and the interest of decentralization is um, the development, the, the geographic development in a number of these countries makes it very difficult to govern particular regions. Um, this is one of the greatest challenges with the peace process in Colombia, where you have certain segments of the country that don't actually have a functioning government that has uh, maintained control over certain territories. Um, one of the most prominent programs that's run by the OAS is something called the International, Inter International Judicial Facilitators Program, where it's about creating sort of these ad hoc unofficial but official judicial procedures that can have these trained judges go out to communities where they don't actually have a court system or access to a police service um, in some of these more rural communities, but then they can still get access to justice despite the fact that the government programs and government capacity doesn't exist in these particular scenarios. I mean, the geography of Mexico, of Brazil, of Argentina, like these are very physically large countries um, with a lot of unruly territory that it's diff difficult to govern. Um, now, that's an advantage to kind of scapegoating. You can kind of pass the blame to states. But at some point, if you want to control power, you have to eliminate those as well. And this is what you saw happen in Venezuela, where governors began to be removed from office and banned from running for office. Um, mayors began to target whenever they weren't reinforcing the kind of consolidation of power into the executive. Um, that process probably would have happened much faster if you didn't have kind of these last boundaries in place as well. Um, I want to be very careful how I phrase my next example, but I think you've seen some interesting tension points taking place in Brazil under the current administration, where you're seeing, um, particularly in response to the COVID crisis, where you're seeing um, some governors um, 
determine that they want to respond differently than the executive of their country. And so they're engaging in different policy practices to provide support services and gain access to vaccines and deliver programs in the country than the national government would be in that particular scenario. Um, some of these tension points definitely hold true in Mexico as well, although their challenges um, are, are very different in terms of kind of a lot more based on security and interest. Um, the opportunity of federalism in these scenarios is that, again, you are creating different centers of power and accountability. When the federal executive is not responsible for everything, other people have capacity to um, run their societies, create freedoms and create structures that don't necessarily have to adhere to the different systems. So you can kind of create these, these pockets um, within a broader society where democracy continues to function in a stronger fashion than it would be perhaps at the center, going back to the point you had made earlier about democracy in the center versus, versus on the edge and on the margins. Um, there have been many discussions about a uh, path back to democracy in Venezuela over uh, and what that could potentially look like. And a number of those scenarios actually include looking at particular states that might be able to reestablish re more democratic structures rather than starting at the actual center. Um, to your point about reaching a majority um, and reaching a majority of decisions, I mean, this is, this is the beauty of the Canadian political system. Um, uh, I, I need to preface this with, um, I actually am a huge proponent of the first past the post system. I think Canada has probably not a perfect, an well, an imperfect democracy. It's one that works pretty well. And while yes, we can definitely speak on the margins. I don't believe in transforming a system when it, that's not really proven to be particularly necessary. Um, but this is also what, what are one of, one of the, what I think is the beauty of the system. Um, as a true Democrat, even though I come from one particular political background, I genuinely believe that you need to actually have a transition back and forth between those holding power so you can actually have a reflective society. And, and by nature, the political system will shift, shift to the left at one point and it'll shift back to the right at another point. And that's sort of how you maintain balance of those particular structures. Um, but I think what you've seen in Canada, particularly at this moment, the, the public is quite content with a government that is perceived to have to engage with all the other parties in order to create a decision. We just went to an election where the outcome was a second minority government, where the message to that is we want a, co a coordinated um, collective discussion between the different groups and the different interests of government in your decision making process. Um, I don't think this is a bad thing. Um, uh, no. <laughs> No good decision making comes when you're in isolation and surrounded by a group of yes, a group of people that all think the same way and, and perceive the same way. When you're looking at kind of the wake of the COVID crisis, um, if you, it, this, these are not isolated issues that are developed, that are being tackled have to be tackled by a particular community. It's it's a whole global community that has to deal with this. So for Canada, that means you have to figure out a rebuilding and a response that's going to work for a region. The, for British Columbia as much as it will for Atlantic Canada, as much as it will for the territories and, and Ontario. Um, in Latin America, you kind of have this similar pattern on a, on a geographic scale with, with the, the human flow of people from one state to the next, um, with the informal economy transcending borders, by having one particular country try to create a solution that's going to work for them, that's not actually going to respond to or solve the COVID crisis or focus on rebuilding. It, it is about creating these bigger con building consensus and finding interests of in, in different groups where there's a win for everybody or an, maybe not a win for everybody, but an advantage for everybody that they can see the net gain and what the outcome is going to be, even if it isn't their best case scenario. Um, because increasingly, we're, we're looking at we're faced with, and particularly as governments, we're faced with challenges that aren't aren't tailored to our particular community, but a piece of it's going to affect us. But it's that they're they're international, broader challenges that we have to address. Thank you very much, uh, Rekha. Just to take off from uh, from from what the the question I asked about Monica uh, asked Monica about in in the context of South Asia, in the context of the Indian subcontinent, in the context of India. Uh, do you think uh, electoral systems may have some bearing on representation in the context uh, of the country that you know best? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, as uh, Monica also pointed out in case of Canada and in Nepal also, you know, there have been a uh, combination mixed uh, electoral system uh, with regard to FTPT and proportional representation. And in India, we have first party post electoral system, but 
uh, since 1989, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, discussion about switching over to uh, this proportional representation system because it gives uh, smaller parties its due, you know. So, uh, but uh, uh, after this, uh, uh, this uh, there was a commission which, uh, in its terms of reference, mentioned that uh, the reforms have to be suggested within the basic without destroying the basic structure of the constitution that is parliamentary form of government so and but since 1989 i think uh, uh, we are having we have switched over from one party dominance to multi party system and uh, so within the past past the uh, within the first past the post electoral system effects of proportional representation are visible in the fragmented party system since 1989 and we are seeing many you know parties getting absolute majorities uh, except so, uh, till till 2014, no party got absolute majority, and we saw minority coalition governments and coalition of 24 parties. And uh, so, uh, but uh, so I think there's no need to switch over to proportional representation system because effects of proportionality are visible in the fragmented party system. And uh, uh, so, uh, I don't think there's uh, it's some uh, mindless, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, means suggestion and uh, to switch over to proportional representation because we are seeing coalition. We have seen coalitions of twenty four parties. If we will switch over to proportional representation, we'll see coalition of fifty parties. So, <laughs> um, I think it has a bearing on uh, this representation. So, but uh, till. 2014, we had this uh, multi-party coalition government, uh, but since 2014 till date, we are seeing one-party majority government. So of course, you know, uh, this representation uh, has become uh, a big uh, challenge, but I hope in future, uh, again, this multi-party system is not going to go away. It's going to stay here and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nico, uh, staying with uh, staying with the issue of parties, um, and and given given the context in which you work, uh, does the presence of a dominant party necessarily um, uh, reduce the level of polarization? Do you think uh, in in a country like South Africa? Certainly, um, and and that goes again about the nature of the party. If it's an open democratic party uh, and it seeks to be inclusive, fantastic. Uh, the ANC was always known as the broad church <laughs> everyone felt belonging to. And in a sense, it was highly necessary that we didn't have a fragmented party system which you can't get, uh, uh, you know, get government. We now pass that. So we are now facing um, uh, the reality of multi parties coming through a system of proportional representation, which we had at all three levels. And now the major, some major cities must be governed, metros are being governed by minority groups, by minority parties, all voting against. Now, the advantage of this would be is you have the strange bedfellows now. I would always call it right-wing, white-dominated party, official opposition, plus an Africanist party governing now in Johannesburg, the biggest city, with a massive budget larger than many provinces. Now, hard, and they're only united to the extent that they don't like the ANC. And can these two divergent groups somewhere get a level of governance and principles compromises together to make the economy grow in Johannesburg because we are in a dismal state. Which takes me back to, to an earlier point uh, I think that Arthur was making about the Swiss system. Now, in South Africa, the concept of, of, of democracy was 50% plus one is the norm. And if you get 50% plus one, you take everything, absolute exclusion of everyone else. And it was then um, in the first five years that you only had a transition, a transitional government of national unity for five years, because the norm is there shall be 50% uh, plus one. 
And the ability of a country, and then I talk with most countries in Africa, the ability to govern as coalitions with minority groups, there is a lot to say, because it's again the story of the feeling excluded, the feeling of marginalized, um, knowing that there's a permanent majority and we will never get any uh, look into resources won't be spread to us, we will have to fight for those resources in a, in a more or less a federal setting. So the investment of trying to bring in a notion that shared rule at the center uh, in as government, and this, this is what happened in Switzerland, as, as Arthur was telling us, uh, to stop the war between the Catholics and the Protestants that you develop this council meeting and it's worked and it works now where right-wing parties, the people's party must uh, govern with the left-wing, with the Greens, the, somehow there's a collective responsibility. Now, if you can get that working in, uh, in, 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 in highly divided society, which means that one has to get divorced with the idea that democracy is a straitjacket of 15% plus one. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Nico. Uh, Arthur, uh, I, I want you to. Uh, uh, so, so we, in, in some of the questions that I've, I've raised so far, I've woven in questions which we've had from the audience. Uh, and I, I uh, in turning to you, Arthur, I, I'm asking you if you could reflect a little bit based on your on, on the paper that you did for us recently. Uh, on, um, uh, on 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 federal democracy and the ch challenges of polarization, uh, on 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 whether you think uh, 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 the erosion of democracy can lead to the failure of a federal system, and or the uh, the erosion of federalism uh, might lead to a uh, uh, the end of the end of democracy. Well, thank you. Um, indeed, uh, there is uh, a certain tension between uh, federalism and democracy, because uh, federalism is a system of uh, division of power between the levels of governments, which, which are in a democratic systems necessarily organized on a territorial level. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the real problems that have to be solved don't, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, are congruent with the, the structure of uh, territories and the di division of power. So this is uh, one uh, issue in a federal system. It divides power, but also it requires uh, power sharing in different uh, modes of coordination. This is this is quite uh, open question. And on the other hand, democracy has necessarily to be organized uh, within these territorial constitutions, uh, uh, constituencies, because this is the only way that you bring together a government and a scope of government uh, and citizens that are able to control the government that is exerting power over them. So uh, in a way, democracy uh, has to be organized in a territory and federalism is uh, more or less uh, uh, functioning between territories, so to speak. So these are two, in a way, dimensions of institutions which are linked. And uh, the processes that uh, go on in these uh, institutions, the actors, actors that are involved, the patterns of interactions and the mode of decision-making are different. So there is a kind of tension always uh, in a federal system. And these tensions can of course lead to uh, not only conflicts, they can all uh, also lead to uh, deadlock situations in policy making. They increase uh, uh, conflicts over power. They can uh, lead to uh, a, a vicious cycle of thrust and repost uh, in policy making or 
uh, in uh, contests about power. So there is a certain risk in these kinds of uh, federal democracies. And this risk increases, of course, with polarization. Polarization is really a bad situation for federal, federal democracies because uh, these federal democracies have a big advantage compared to autocracies and to uh, unitary systems. In their diverse structure, in their multidimensional structure, they allow to express different conflicts. They represent different groups and they, uh, in a way, also institutionalize conflict and the managing of conflicts uh, of, of societies. And uh, these tensions not only are uh, disadvantages of federal democracies, they are, so to speak, also the driving forces of democracies and federal democracies, because uh, these tensions, uh, as well as the conflicts, and the contestation of power uh, are, so to speak, uh, elements of the democratic process. Uh, and the multidimensional institutionalization of these conflicts uh, allows to bring different matters on the agenda of politics. Uh, they drive responsible uh, political actors to respond to these different demands to take into account different uh, interests, to, to take into account the interests of others that are expressed uh, in these, uh, in these uh, uh, complex political systems, and always to search for compromises and to search for agreements. Of course, we should also be aware that uh, because nobody is finally supreme, even if there is majority democracy or if there is a separation of power, nobody is supreme in these complex systems. Uh, and if there always has to be a search of uh, agreements under the condition that power and decisions can always be contested, uh, these federal systems require always to search for a balance of power and interests. However, there is never a final balance of power uh, of interest. So federal democracies, in a way, uh, organize processes of managing conflicts and of searching the balance, of continuing searching of, uh, uh, of balance. Polarization uh, can, uh, of course, seriously damage these processes. They can uh, be a serious problems, and in particular for federal democracies, because as we know from literature uh, on democracy and the backlash of democracy, polarization usually materializes as in, in democracy as ideological conflicts between parties, as uh, conflicts between extremist parties. However, in a federal democracy, it can, in a way, uh, shift uh, and transfer to the relations between levels of governments. It can affect the coordination of policies, the intergovernmental relations. And I think uh, the American system is currently a good example that uh, this problem, uh, in a way, uh, reinforces the polarization within uh, the, the, uh, the federal system. Um, so there is, in a way, uh, uh, a certain risk uh, of polarization within federal uh, democracies. However, I strongly believe that federal democracies provide also solutions that can uh, reduce and mitigate uh, polarization. And the reason why is, and we have discussed about it, uh, the reason why is uh, that uh, federal di uh, democracy, in a way, compel actors to uh, deal with these continuous tensions. And if you look at uh, the solutions that has uh, found in real federations for these conflicts, you find that uh, in practice, uh, there are many ways uh, to manage these conflicts, not so much in uh, organizing or reforming democracies because election systems, patterns of democracies are quite difficult to, to change. They have usually to be as given. The chance that we discussed about this 
to, to the chance to deal with this polarization is to find modes of multi-level uh, governance, modes of multi-level coordinations that support democracy, that uh, uh, bring people together in communicative structures, not in decision-making. Decision-making has to be left finally to the democratic institution within governments. But the organization of federal systems has to uh, be in a way so that this coordination between levels has to uh, be made in a democracy preserving way, leaving uh, opportunities for parliaments, for citizens to make the final decisions by considering external effects and uh, consequences of these decisions uh, to others. And uh, there are many uh, 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 solutions uh, and ideas uh, to find these uh, democracy preserving uh, coordination. Mainly they are, so to speak, soft processes, communicative processes, where uh, there is no final decision, where, where there is a continuous adjustment of uh, coordination, uh, where there is, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, um, an, a mutual uh, adjustment, a continuous mutual adjustment and mutual respect. So this is a way to, uh, let's say, flexibly combine the different institutional conditions that uh, we have in federal and uh, uh, democratic systems, which create tensions, but which enforce, so to speak, actors in a pragmatic way to deal with tensions. And that can, in the final, in, in the last resource, also reduce tensions uh, and, and polarization. These are very uh, abstract and uh, probably not a clearly practical idea. They, these ideas always have to be uh, applied to very specific situation that uh, vary between different countries. But I at least do hope that uh, they could probably uh, provide some guidelines uh, for further discussions and for uh, creative actors in the particular federations and democracies. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, before I close the panel, we do have one. Uh, we do have a question uh, specifically that came up, Arthur, while you were talking about the issue of, um, uh, you know, in, in some countries, the, the issue of ethnic polarization, soft borders. So I, I'll, I'll open this question up for anyone who wants to answer. Uh, and the question is: With the suggestion of soft borders between federal entities, especially those that embody ethnic differences to combat polarization, how should threats of secession? Uh, be managed. So whoever wants to uh, take this, uh... Nico, go ahead. No, I just think um, the Federation is, is in the end a compact. And, um, and you stay in, the, in, in this compact if it's attractive. If it becomes unattractive, people want to get out. And in Africa, there was attempts uh, to federalize Sudan to make it uh, attractive for the South to remain in Sudan, and, and nothing was done. So it's the notion of, of, of this common citizenship, the notion of e uh, substantive equality of citizenship. So it doesn't really matter where you live, you are entitled to a certain level of, 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 of conditions of living, of education, of health, so that it is an, an attractive uh, proposition to remain there and that you share in, 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 in the benefits and the resources of a country. So, uh, to th and, and, and that goes back to my earlier point, if in fact you think all your uh, benefits will come only from your uh, uh, unit, then I think one uh, do not share in the benefits of the entire country. It sets the, 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 the unit on course for secession. And so the emphasis again, build the center, build the attractiveness of being together. And there are a number of techniques to do so. Thank you. Any, any, would anyone else uh, like to? Uh, go ahead, Monica. I just kind of want to build on that point. I mean, that 
I mean, the advantage for a democratic system, generally, whether it's federal or not, is that there, there is a positive incentive for people to participate. I mean, democracy is founded in a social contract where individuals at a very basic level give up certain rights to be part of a broader community because there's interest. That's personal security, it's economic opportunity, it's, it's like border security. Um, and whether it's a, an ethnic group or a particular segment or state population or geographic population, what matters is that they actually feel that their voices are heard and there's a response to them from government, that there is actually in fact an, a, an active interaction between government and their voices. It doesn't mean that the decision has to go their way every single time, but they have to feel themselves represented in, in not only in the discussions, but in the outcome of those decisions as well. Um, democracy inevitably needs to be organic. Um, and federalism in and of itself its opportunity and its strength lies in the fact that it actually has the capacity to offer this unique specialization, that unique specialization that they understand the interests of this particular ethnic community, or they understand this geographic or industry related particular issue, that they have that particular expertise to benefit that community. Um, the, the tensions and the divisions and appetite for succession and frustration with governments generally come from the lack of communication and when that did, when that dialogue starts being one-sided, when people are calling and demanding things from government, and then there's no response on that other particular side. Um, so the, the, the key answer to that is essentially making sure that these federal structures actually function and can actually deliver for their particular citizens. Thank you very much. Uh, can so, I come in? Yeah, oh yeah, please. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Just to add to what uh, my colleague said, I think one of the advantages uh, of federal democracy, especially in case of India, is that like uh, in other federation also that uh, groups that are aspiring for greater autonomy could bargain with the federal government. And that has happened. Uh, there have been several commissions which have been set up in India from time to time and different state governments, they have sent their memorandums, their demands. And uh, uh, they have been uh, the uh, like Sakarya Commission, I mean, Panchi Commission, and they've tried to accommodate their demands. So it depends. I think it's not, uh, as others said, federalism is not only about uh, power sharing, political power sharing, but also sharing the commonwealth of the nation. So, and uh, India has, Indian constitution has provided, uh, uh, you know, for, you know, uh, equalization of payments and through. Uh, uh, for poorer provinces. And uh, of course, there's a lot to be achieved, but I think uh, in India, federalism uh, and uh, democracy, they are synonymous and they, it has helped, federalism has helped in achieving, you know, national unity uh, in a deeply divided polity like India. And thanks to the freedom struggle against the uh, British colonial rule and uh, also to the nationalist leadership in the Nehru and I would say post Nehru, uh, era, uh, which could not have been possible on the basis of just one man, one boat to begin with. So I think federal principles of power sharing has helped in holding uh, the nation together. But of course, there it can be, there are disadvantages also in Indian case also, as I pointed out earlier, uh, with regard to uh, some uh, communities getting more privileges and uh, some ethnic groups. Uh, like 35A, that was discriminatory to women in case of German Kashmir between residents of the state and other Indian citizens, but also between two state citizens on the basis of, you know, uh, declaring some as permanent residents while other losing it out. But on the whole, I would say that uh, it uh, in India, it has been, you know, advantages and uh, they go together, democracy and federalism go together because diversities with uh, diversities and complexities that India um, has, you know, would not have been united into a nation without the federal principle. And if India survives as a nation, it's, I think, mainly due to the role uh, of federal constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we're going to wrap up the session now. There are a couple of other questions uh, that um, I, 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 we, I, we, won't, uh, we won't be able to answer, uh, particularly uh, given, given the, uh, the time at hand. Uh, so I want to thank the panelists uh, for their time and contributing to this discussion. Uh, I, I, I know we deviated a bit, bit from the script that, uh, that, that we had circulated, but I think it was very important to touch on some of these points because some of the questions that are incoming and have come in the past, uh, in, uh, through the course of the discussion, 
uh, touch on some of these issues that are uh, related, you know, directly related to conflict management and federalism and the complexity of, of managing a federal system. And of course, I, I always say uh, that yes, federal systems are more complex than unitary systems. But one of the reasons countries are federations is because they're dealing with a with a with with uh, with complex issues of diversity of uh, uh, complex societies, divided societies, and uh, and then that just is the nature of the beast. So thank you everyone who uh, who participated, uh, watched us, and a special thanks for uh, the panelists who took time out of the very busy schedule to be with us across uh, many different time zones. And uh, we hope to see you back at a future discussion. Thank you. <laughs>